の夏スクエアがでっかいシリーズ始めますブレイブフェンサー武蔵伝 When you think of Squaresoft in the 90s, what comes to mind? A mature and epic story? A grand quest to save the world? CERN based combat? Probably all the above, right? Most of their games from that era did feature either one or more of these elements. However, there were some other titles that shook up this formula entirely. Now, obvious examples of this would be the times when they branched out of RPGs, but that's not the case here. The game we're talking about today is still an RPG, it's just one that does not have a mature story, you're not traveling on a grand journey to save the world, and it is not turn based. Enter Brave Fencer Musashi. Brave Fencer Musashi! A light hearted Saturday morning cartoon type action RPG that takes elements from both the Zelda series and the Kirby series. Yeah, sounds pretty intriguing, right? Well, you've come to the right place, my friend, as in this video I'm gonna 100% complete the entire game and see just how well that holds up 25 years later. But first, let's briefly go over a little bit of background info, both on the game itself and my personal history with it. Let's set the vibe though. Cue the intro. The light is your guide. Dream is what keeps you going. Ray Fencer Musashi was released for the PlayStation on July 16, 1998 in Japan and November 12th in North America. Yeah, no European or PAL release I guess. I'm sorry mates. When it comes to the development, there's a few names I want to highlight, one in particular. And I'm just gonna apologize now if I butcher any names. First, we have the director, Yoichi Yoshimoto. From what I could gather online, he's only directed 5 titles throughout his career. This game, its sequel, Musashi Samurai Legend, the Final Fantasy IV interlude, and Batman Returns and the Adventures of Batman and Robin? Huh, well that's pretty interesting. Not really the most natural progression, but hey, it works. Next up, we have the composer, Tsuyoshi Sekido. It seems like he's had a pretty solid career, contributing to various works over the years even as recently as the Final Fantasy VII Remake and Kingdom Hearts III. With that said, Brave Fencer Musashi is probably the biggest game he ever got to lead compose for. That and The Last Remnant, another Square title. Last, but certainly not least, we have character designer Tetsuya Nomura. Yes, the same Nomura that would go on to create the Kingdom Hearts series, would direct Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, and would co-direct the Final Fantasy VII Remake project. Yeah, kind of a big deal. Before he directed these big budget titles though, he made his mark as a character designer and man, is that kind of an understatement to be honest. His style defined late 90s and 2000s square. Final Fantasy VII was the first time he ever got the lead as a character designer, and he never looked back. Outside of a few exceptions, he designed the characters for almost every mainline Final Fantasy entry since. It's not just Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts he designed for though. There's Parasite Eve, The World Ends With You, The Bouncer, and yeah, okay, maybe he went a little overboard there. Yeah, yeah, I know. Anyway, Numero's a pretty big name in the gaming industry these days, so I just think it's cool to see one of his earliest works. I'll talk more about his character design in this game later in this video. When Brave Fencer Musashi was released, it was received pretty well. A solid 81 on Metacritic, in fact. Critics praised the visuals, the music, and the gameplay. A lot of them compared it to Zelda, and I know I did earlier as well. However, while there are some similarities on the surface and execution, they're actually quite different. Brave Fencer Musashi has a bigger focus on platforming and less on puzzles for one, and the progression of the game also plays out in a different way. More on that later though. Anyway, the game was not only received pretty well, but it sold pretty well too. About 650,000 in Japan in its first year and just shy of a million worldwide. Though it's hard to say how much of this was due to interest in the game alone or just because there was a Final Fantasy VIII demo disc included. Yeah, this without a doubt caused a boost in sales. They let you know right on the cover and I'm sure it incised some people in. No, the official Brave Fencer Musashi strategy guide even includes a walkthrough for the Final Fantasy VIII demo. That's how big of a deal this was. It's not why I got it though, I just thought the case looked cool. As a kid, I played this for a while, but not gonna lie, I never got super far. I would restart multiple playthroughs, but would always get lost like 10 hours in or something. I'm curious if there was a good reason why for that, or if I was just a stupid kid. 
I did manage to beat games like Xenogears at that age though, so yeah, I guess we'll see. One last thing. Like all of our other retrospectives, I am going to walk through the very beginning of the story, but all late game spoilers will be marked with timestamps later in the video. So, without further ado, join me on this journey as we take a deep dive, nostalgic look back at one of Squaresoft's forgotten titles from the 90s. This, my friends, is a retrospective over Bray Fencer Musashi. Let's do it! Man, right off the bat, so much charm already. I love the little Bray Fence and Musashi soundbite and the whole let's do it when selecting start. Over 20 years later and I've never forgotten that. Huge fan of the title screen too. Such a sleek look. The sword in the background, the silhouette of Musashi, the English and Japanese text, the clean font, the cursor symbols, it's just all so good. Just a top tier title screen. Anyway, you may have noticed the title actually says Bray Fence and Musashi Den instead of Bray Fence and Musashi. That's what it's called in Japan and stands for Bray Fence and Musashi Story, however they changed it in the west to avoid confusion on what the character's name was. I get it, but as a kid, it still always confused me to hear Bray Fencer Musashi when it clearly reads Bray Fencer Musashi Den. Bray Fencer Musashi! Alright, the game begins with this cool shot of the moon as it then pans down to... a La Canite Palace? Yeah, I know it's all you can eat, but as a kid, I somehow never picked up on this despite all the other food-based names. I mean, the first characters you see, for God's sake, are Stuart Ripson, Butler Livers, and Princess Fillet, and my dumbass was over there with drool coming out of my mouth all like, oh, look and eat. Yeah, maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed back in the day. Anyway, everyone's all in a panic. Princess Fillet asks why the bench outside is so large, that's what she said, and then is told she needs to perform a hero summon. With the power of thoughts and prayers, she then summons Bray Fencer Musashi. Brave His entrance is a bit anticlimactic, though, as everyone's making fun of him for being small and puny. By the way, why does Princess Fillet all of a sudden get a milk mustache when he starts yelling at him? I like how Stuart repeats what she says and calls us Sir Little Turd. It's like, dude, you knew my name before you even summoned me. Don't play dumb now. You and your little doff thou with the wither me hither with bullshit. Yeah, I'm on to you, dude. As is obvious, Musashi comes from a more Japanese-inspired place, whereas the all-you-can-eat kingdom is more medieval Europe, so yeah, we got an isekai here. We're then told we have to save their world before we can go back to ours, and alright, I know what some of you guys are thinking. You said in the intro you don't save the world in this game, and yeah, alright, he says that, but honestly, the stakes never really feel that high, and if by world you mean the literal one town you go to in the entire game and its surrounding areas, then yeah, I guess you technically save the world. This isn't inherently a bad thing, but the scope of this game's world is actually quite small. I never really got that save the world vibe, but more like just help out this kingdom in its small town. Anyway, we're also told if you run out of Bencho energy, we will die and... Ugh, man, ain't that the truth. More on that later though. Stewart tells us we need to go to a place called Spiral Tower, but first he gives us a sword called Fusion. This lets you copy enemies' abilities and I'm just gonna let them explain it because... Yeah, this game has voice acting. A lot of it. When it pierces an enemy, it absorbs and assimilates its abilities. Next, it and the ability comes back to you to utilize. It's called Assimilate. No, it's called Kirby. Yeah, this is where some elements from that series come into play. Really cool idea and concept, but maybe it could have been executed a little bit better. I'll talk more about this in a bit. Princess Fillet tells us to acquire the Sword of Luminescence, Lumina, from the top of Spiral Tower. That and the power of the Five Scrolls can apparently save the world. So, off we go. Or off we win, as Musashi already chucked up the deuces before she finished talking. Chapter 1 then officially begins as we gain control of Musashi. To start things off, uh, what's with the range on the sword? Am I swinging a sword around or a stick? You have to get super close to enemies to hit them to where you're practically on top of them. Fortunately, you do get another sword soon that has way better range, but yeah, this first sword kind of sucks and doesn't make the best first impression. There's definitely some jank you instantly notice. The hitboxes can maybe feel slightly off at times and some drops from enemies can get stuck on the side where you can't go to. This isn't a recurring problem, thankfully, but I did notice it here. When it comes to attacking, we have a basic 4-hit combo, though there are more combos to learn later on. 
You can also pick up enemies and throw them. Hell, you can even knock enemies back into each other to create a ricochet effect. Pretty cool. Alright, so we come across a stream we can't pass, but aha, let's assimilate this dude's ability to shoot the bridge down. To do this, you just hold R1 until this meter fills up, press square to throw it at the enemy, and then tap square to fill that meter back up. Voila, you're now the wielder of a new ability, and in this case, that ability being Gunshot. Assimilating is a simple process, but it can be a little annoying too. After priming your throw with R1, while you can move around, you can't change direction, so if an enemy is moving around out of your line of sight, you're SOL. Also, if you get attacked by another enemy while tapping square, you have to restart the process. It's not like it takes that long, so it's not that big of a deal, but it can lead to some minor annoyances here and there. Anyway, abilities use BP, which are bench hole points, and the amounts used depends on the ability. And so yeah, this is kind of like your traditional MP. Huh, in Kirby you can use abilities as much as you want, so this is different. I'm sure it's to prevent you from spamming the same strong ability over and over again, so I get it. With that said, this first ability gunshot is kind of a piece of shit. Definitely more of just a gimmick to knock down stuff instead of an actual practical weapon. I mean, look at this. I can't even tell where I'm firing, I don't know, the range, the damage sucks, it's just easier to whack him with a sword. I'll just say it now, the abilities in this game range greatly. Some are gimmicky and only used like once or twice, some are absolutely awesome, and others are entirely useless. I'll talk more about these later. So, we make it through the forest and arrive at Spiral Tower. Whenever I think of this game, this shot of the statue head instantly comes to mind. I had this old GamePro magazine back in the day that was like this big review edition where it had a ton of mini reviews over a lot of PS1 games separated by the genre. In the RPG section, this is the screenshot they used for Brave Finch and Musashi. Man, I looked at this thing so much as a kid, look at how torn to shit it is. I formed a lot of early opinions on games I never played back then based on this. Looking back though, probably not the wisest idea. I mean, look at how they reviewed Suikoden 2 and Xenogears. Yeah, credibility shot. Anyway, tangent aside, we have to destroy these four statues and step on these four symbols to get the tower to rise up. I like that the game prepares you for this by forcing you to destroy a statue early in the forest, showing you that it can be done. Good game design. Also, does anyone else get Kadingle vibes from Wild Arms with a little tower raising up thing? No? Just me? Alright. We now have to make our way up the tower, dodging some objects in the process. Jumping feels really good in this game, but the depth perception, this can be a little annoying at times. Even though I did get hit a couple times, it's really not that bad here, I just wasn't used to it. It's definitely much worse trying to jump onto a platform or something. Alright, now we're inside the tower. This hanging skeleton thing looks a little creepy and unfitting, no? The note we received from Princess Fillet earlier reads that once the Guardian Flame is blanketed with darkness, a light will lead you above. Okay, let's make our way up then. Because I was so reckless earlier, I actually almost died right here. Like, look at this shit, I had 1 HP. The RNG gods blessed me to live another day. I was about to feel like a dumbass if I died in the first 10 minutes of Brave Fencer Musashi. I make it to the top and see a giant bell hanging above this flame. Ah, the note about the Guardian Flame being blanketed with darkness. I know just what to do. Throw this dude and knock that bitch down. Nah, well that didn't work. No, oh, I should probably just shoot it down with gunshot. Yeah, that works too, I guess. We're then transported to the roof of the tower with that statue head forming a barrier around Lumina. Oh yeah, there's a lot of enemies too. When we step on this symbol, the barrier stops. However, when we step off, it turns back on. So, we need to lure an enemy over here and get him to step on it. What you're supposed to do is assimilate the ability stun from them so you can get them to stay on. I did not do this though, as I was clearly not thinking. Instead, I angrily spent about 10 minutes trying to get these dudes to stay on here and got super frustrated in the process. Like look here, I even got there in time but didn't press the button fast enough. So annoying. Lesson learned and little rule of thumb for this game. If you're ever feeling stuck, assimilate any abilities you can find around you. Anyway, with sheer luck, I finally got one dude to stay on there and acquire the Sword of Luminescence, Lumina. The moment of triumph is quickly interrupted though and I'll let this scene play out so you can get a better feel for how charming this game really is.
away as I just hang up there after falling in classic Looney Tunes fashion. The comedic music, the whole jump sound bite. Yeah, if there was anyone out there who still didn't know this game wasn't meant to be taken seriously, well, now you know. How is he to find gravity and running straight down in a vertical line? Uh, he's Bray Fencer Musashi, dude. He, he does what he wants. Now we get a classic Crash Bandicoot boulder chasing segment. Man, this game has it all. It's good they prepared us a bit to go with the jump prompts, because now we gotta put them to the test and... Shit. What the? Well, first game over screen. Hopefully the last one. I'm better prepared this time and know what's coming up, so... Shit. If I'm reincarnated, I want to be Musashi again. I'm playing this on an emulator with a Bluetooth controller. I'm just gonna chalk this up to a little bit of input delay. I swear I was pressing jump. At least I came to learn that Musashi has different voice quotes for the game over screen, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, after getting a hang of the timing, I clear this no prop. Brave Fencer Musashi has various mini games to break up the pace, and they're all pretty fun. They give the game some good flavor and variety. We're now inside the castle, and the princess has been captured by this dude with a southern accent by the name of Rutrik. He surrounds us with a circle of flames to which we then learn a new ability. By holding R1 then pressing triangle, we can do a spinning sword attack to distinguish the flames. Link over there giving Musashi the side eye right now. Alright, maybe the reviewers had a point with Zelda. Before I can kick this dude's ass, he falcon punches the princess and teleports out of here. Falcon PUNCH! Jesus Christ, calm down dude, she's like 12 years old. Rutrik may have deuced out, but he left a little friend to play. The Steam Knights of the Thirst Quencher Empire. Yeah, we got the all-you-can-eat kingdom and the Thirst Quencher Empire. I did tell you there was a lot of food puns. And as with any other work of fantasy fiction, kingdom good, empire bad. Boss battles in Brave Fencer Musashi are a real standout, and this first fight is no exception. Most of them are these big epic set pieces where you have to learn their patterns and strike their weakness. Yeah, another Zelda similarity, I know. Anyway, not gonna lie, this first boss is actually kinda hard. Harder than I expected, at least. In fact, I'd even say it was one of the hardest bosses in the game for me. It's mainly because you don't have access to a lot of moves yet, your HP is low and you have no way of healing your HP. Three things that are all rectified later in the game. I underestimated him at first and was being pretty reckless until I realized there were three phases and was like, shit, I may be in trouble here. I died at the very end when he had like one hit left. So lame. Let's try again and actually take it seriously this time. His first phase is super easy. Being the first boss, I like that the game tells you exactly where to hit. No need to waste time trying to figure out where you can actually damage him. Just avoid his attacks and strike when you get a chance. By the way, the hitbox here can be a little janky. You have to line yourself up perfectly to hit him. There were some times where I swear I was hitting him, but the game didn't register it for some reason. This actually happens with multiple bosses too. It doesn't make it unplayable by any means, but it can just be a little annoying at times. Phase 2 is more of the same. Pretty easy. It's Phase 3 where things start getting a little hard. His Wrecking Ball attack is faster and more sporadic, and his big jump attack can be a bitch to dodge. Thankfully, Musashi is not only a samurai, but a superhero with superhuman strength as well, as after we defeat this thing, we chuck it off the cliff and then throw a giant boulder at it to finish the job off. Join me in this triumphant moment of glory. Our homeboy Musashi then catches some Z's and the chapter ends. Chapter 2 then begins and this is where the game truly begins as well. We talk to Ripson and Butler Livers about saving the princess and collecting the five scrolls and off we go. We have to stop by the library first though and we have no choice even though the game gives us the illusion of choice. Like I'm brave into Musashi dude, I don't got time for books, I got a princess to save. Dang! Huh, what's up with all these books? No, in all actuality, the library explains some lore, so that's pretty cool. Though, let's be honest, in a game like this, does lore really matter? With that said, you do unlock more of it as the game goes on, and there does come a time later in the game where you need some info from here to find a dungeon. You may have also noticed that I was brought directly here instead of walking to the library myself. Well, while there is an explorable town in this game, the all-you-can-eat castle is not. There's a list of locations in the castle you can select, and the game just automatically brings you there. Honestly, I'm not a fan of this. I much would have preferred being able to explore around and walk there myself. It makes it hard for me to get immersed when games do stuff like this. 
Plus, it would've been cool to see how your castle grows and becomes more lively as you rescue more people. Rescuing people? Yeah, I should probably explain that, shouldn't I? You remember how earlier I was talking about how fusion abilities use BP, which stands for Bencho Points? Well, there are these things called Bencho Fields as well that you can find while exploring. You'll know if you're close to one by a little character icon in the lower right corner flashing red. When you do find it, you slash it with Lumina to release a person from the castle that was trapped inside there. Though sometimes I may wish they were still in there as you can release them in the midst of enemies everywhere. You liberated me from my imprisonment and instead brought me sweet death by the hands of martial arts ice wolves. Thank you. Yeah, this can be a little jank at times with enemies just nonchalantly walking right through. There are 35 bencho fields to release in total, and after doing so, you permanently gain 5 BP. You're forced to find a handful of these for the Chapter 2 boss, but after that, they're pretty much entirely optional. I like this. It encourages you to explore and rewards you for doing so. They're all pretty reasonable to find, too, so if you're thorough in exploring your environments, you should come across most of them. Some are certainly trickier to find than others, but that's where the fun and exploration comes from. Like look here, the bridge in Twin Peak Mountain. I thought I was about to fall to my death, but nah, the hidden area in a bencho field. Nice. There's even a little bit of a Metroidvania type aspect at times with having to revisit previous areas after finding new scrolls. Like after getting the water scroll, I was trekking through Somnolent Forest and was like, huh, now that I can walk on water, I wonder where this goes. I love that I was rewarded for this. I'm a big fan of Collect-a-Thon, so this kind of scratches that itch a bit. Considering they're not that hard to find and you can add 175 BP if you do, you bet your ass I found them all. This is not the only benefit they provide, however. Depending on the person you save, they can actually aid Musashi in various ways. They don't help you right on the spot though, you have to visit them in the castle first. Little annoying, but I get why they did this. To receive certain perks, you have to release a group of people first, like a group of musicians or group of clowns for example, as opposed to just releasing one person. Amongst these perks, they vary a lot. Some unlock new items to buy in the shop, some provide clues on how to progress forward, and stuff like that. The most useful, though, are definitely the people that help you learn new sword techniques. There are six total techniques you can learn throughout the game to expand your offensive arsenal. These can be executed by pressing different button combinations. I'm not gonna lie, though, I didn't really get as much use out of these as I would have liked, as I kind of completely forgot to visit people for most of the game. I think it was like chapter 4 or something that I finally started visiting them and was like, oh shit, there's new techniques you can learn? That would have been nice hours ago. It's completely my fault though, so it's all good. Some people tell you to visit them as they have something to give you, but yeah, I just kind of forgot, I guess. Anyway, I think this is a pretty cool system. The whole concept of releasing people from an object to restore a town is very similar to games like Soul Blazer on the Super Nintendo and the Dark Cloud games on the PS2. In fact, I'm sure Dark Cloud took inspiration from Brave Fence and Musashi and Soul Blazer for that matter. If I'm being honest though, going back to what I said earlier, I don't think Brave Fence and Musashi implements this as well as it could have. See, in games like Soul Blazer and Dark Cloud, you actually get to see your town grow, which is very satisfying. Unfortunately, Brave Fence and Musashi does not give you the same satisfaction. Like I said earlier, actually being able to walk around the castle and see it fill out with more people would have been really nice. It would have given it some Suikoden vibes and that would have been cool. No well. While the castle may not be explorable, at least the village connected to it is. Grillin Village acts as your main hub throughout the game and you're going to be spending a lot of time here. You can rest up, visit shops, talk to people, and every area in the game branches off from here. One small touch I really love is how every shopkeeper has voice acting and greets you with a voiced quote as you walk in. Welcome! Make yourself at home! It just gives it a homey vibe. Chris Hansen might want to keep a tab on the bartender though. Oh, you're cute. Is this your first time at a place like this, baby? Lady, chill. I'm like 13 years old and 4 feet tall. Another really cool thing about the village is how everyone has their own schedule they follow on a daily basis. As I'm sure you all have already noticed, in the lower right corner there is a time shown. Brave Fence and Musashi operates on a 24 hour clock system and a day and night cycle. While this definitely wasn't the first game to implement a day and night cycle, I think it's one of the first to do so in a more meaningful way. The clock moves in 15 minute intervals about every 6 seconds in real time. So in other words, for one day to pass, it takes about 9.5 to 10 real-time minutes. You can also take a little nap whenever you want, and this makes it time pass every 1 second instead of every 6 seconds. This heals your HP and reduces your tired meter as well, but only to 20%. You have to rest at the end in order to get it to zero. Your BP does still drop while napping though, but I'll get to how this and the tired meter affects gameplay in a bit. First, let's finish talking about how the day and night cycle actually works. Well, I gotta be honest, I think I like the idea better than the execution. I didn't find this to affect the game in a fun way, but more so in an annoying way, actually. 
Besides the inn, shops all have their own times that they stay open, and that does sound cool and realistic, but in actuality, it really just means you're wasting time waiting around for them to open. Yeah, you can always nap to make the time go by faster, but this can still be like a minute of doing nothing. It's even worse sometimes when a random shop will be closed on a Monday or something, and if you happen to try to go there on a Monday, it's like, well, I guess I'm not doing anything for the next couple minutes then. The concept of villagers having their own schedule is a cool idea, but I feel like there's missed potential here. It really just boils down to them either walking around or farming at certain times of the day, or chilling at home where you can try to visit them. Oh yeah, that's another thing. You can't actually walk in houses in this game. You just knock on their door where they'll either say something to you or just not answer. This is honestly pretty lame. I'm not a fan of this. The only time to time aspect really comes into play are a few moments during the main story, like where you have to meet this priest at 2am or have to wait for these two girls to stop gossiping in front of the well and go to bed so you can go inside. I mean, I guess this technically utilizes the time mechanic, but is it really that interesting if the game just tells you what to do and all you simply do is wait for it to happen? I'd much rather come across things on my own because I was curious enough to go to certain spots at certain times of the day or seek out certain people at certain times of the day. Like imagine if between the hours of 5 and 7 a.m. you could go to that bridge in the Somnolent Forest and there would be some guy fishing there and he would be like, Hey, I'm trying to fish, but I don't have a strong enough rod. Will you go to Twin Peak Mountain and chop down a tree for me, which is something you already do in the main story, and then bring it back to me so I can make a stronger rod? Then if you do that, some type of fish could be unlocked in the grocery store that you can then start buying. And stuff like that would be really cool. Sadly, there's really no major side quests built around the time system. I guess there are those Mikus you can find that increase your max HP, and they only come out at night, but even if you go to where they'd be at during the day, they leave animal dung there to mark the spot. Yeah, I'm not joking. So again, the time of the day really doesn't matter with this. The only difference is if you come across it during the day, you just have to nap till nighttime. In its defense, the first time figuring this out would be cool, but the subsequent 12 times? Well, I guess I'm just napping. Okay, well I guess if you find all of them, there's an optional boss fight with the mother Minku, and she also only comes out at night. While she is extremely easy, and I'd hesitate to even call this a boss fight really, this is still pretty cool, so I'll take it. I guess I'm more referring to side quests based on a person's schedule. In this regard, I think there's missed potential. But to use another Zelda comparison, Majora's Mask did something like this so much better. People having their own schedules actually matters, as there's tons of side quests to trigger at various times of the day. I know Majora's Mask came out later, and a large part of that game was built around this very concept, so it's not fair to compare them, but still. The point I'm making is that Brave Fence and Musashi could have just done a little bit more with this. Radiated Stories also did the whole people having their own schedule thing really well. These games may have done it better, but hey, we still gotta give props to Brave Fence and Musashi for laying part of that foundation down. Make no mistake, Brave Fence and Musashi walked so Majora's Mask and Radiated Stories could run. Last thing I'll say about the time system. Different music does play during certain areas when it's nighttime, like The Village for example, and this song is pretty cozy. I believe either stronger or more abundant enemies also come out during the forest at night. Just thought these small details were worth noting. Earlier I mentioned how there was a tired meter, and this is pretty self-explanatory. The longer you're out and about without resting, the higher this percentage increases. If you let the percentage get too high, Musashi will start walking and can no longer run until you bring it down. To do this, you can either use an item or use the nap mechanic. Two problems with this though. Well, three actually. One, inventory space is really limited and you still need to worry about having items that can heal your HP and BP as well. Two, having to set aside some time just to nap is annoying. And three, your HP might increase while you're napping, but your BP decreases. Yes, this wasn't a thing in chapter one, but in chapter two onwards, your BP just gradually drops, even when doing nothing. You can just be standing in town, but it still drops. Now you might be thinking, well that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, you just can't use fusion abilities as much. And if that was just it, that would totally be fine, but... Well... If your BP gets too low, you can't run either, and if it drops to zero, you start losing HP. In most other action RPGs, you only have two meters to worry about. An HP meter and probably some NP meter of sorts. And when that NP meter does fully deplete, it's not like all of a sudden you can't run anymore and start losing HP. Well, Brave Fence and Musashi does that, and has a third meter to worry about that can hinder gameplay if you don't keep it in check. I don't want to use fusion abilities too much because, well, I don't want my BP to drop too low. Some enemies do drop BP, but they can also drop HP and money as well, so this isn't always reliable. I fully believe you could remove the whole BP gradually dropping thing and the tired meter completely and the game wouldn't be negatively affected for it, in fact it would be even better. In my opinion, all I think it does is create tedium and artificially pad the length. I will say though, this is only really a problem in maybe like the first 20% of the game. After that, you should have enough HP and BP that this stops mattering as much. Well, I guess a tired meter is always annoying, but at least you don't have to worry about dying. 
It's just the first few hours where the HP, BP, and sleep meter resource management can be a little stressful. It's a very popular opinion that the best part of this entire game is the last chapter and guess what it has? Or rather, what it doesn't have. No tired meter and BP doesn't gradually drop. Coincidence? That's for you to decide. Anyway, I've been complaining a lot, let's switch it up to something more positive. I feel like this game handles movement extremely well. When I first got a grill in Village, I was running around, climbing up trees, jumping off poles, running on railings, then yeah, I was legit impressed with how good it felt. As someone who's replayed a bunch of platformers from this era in the past year, like the Crash Trilogy, the Spyro Trilogy, Banjo-Kazooie, Bomberman Hero, Kirby 64, and more, take it from me, the controls feel pretty good here. With that said, while the movement itself feels good, the platforming involving the movement, uh, maybe not so much sometimes. It's mainly just the depth perception when jumping to the side. Sometimes I'll try to jump onto a platform and just miss by a mile. This must be where John was talking about. But yeah, the movement itself though, good stuff. With that said, Musashi doesn't start with every movement option at his disposal. As you find legendary armor throughout the game, some of these grant you new moves. The legendary brace, for example, lets you climb certain walls. Animation looks a little janky when you get near the top though. Like look, I'm sticking my sword in air. By the way, the climbing a pole animation also looks a little... <laughs> interesting. The most useful armor though is definitely the legendary belt. This lets you do a double jump and a back jump. The double jump alone is just incredibly useful. The legendary vest is pretty useful too. This increases your charging speed, which is nice. What's not useful though are the goggles. These just appraise items on the spot, so you can sell them at the pawn shop later. Considering it was already free to appraise things at the pawn shop and you have to go there to sell them anyway, you can see why this is pointless. I think it comes in handy literally one time when you find the legendary shoes of the Ice Palace and don't have to backtrack all the way to town to appraise them. Besides that though, it's pretty much a throwaway piece of armor and seems like they didn't know what to do with it. With that said, our little homie looks pretty flying. I love how your in-game model actually changes based on which armor you have. By the end of the journey, you look like a completely new Musashi. Pretty cool stuff. While we're talking about the legendary armor, we might as well talk about the five scrolls. Or as Musashi would say, the five scrolls! What about the five scrolls? I mainly just want to talk about their gameplay component. After collecting each scroll, you gain new abilities. The earth scroll lets you do a ground pound with your sword. The fire scroll lets you spew out flames. The water scroll lets you spew out water and walk on water. The wind scroll lets you spin around in a gust by passing strong winds. And the sky scroll lets you float for a period of time. These abilities are cool, but they kind of end up being a little more gimmicky than anything. They're mainly just used for the respective Crest Guardian boss fight in the dungeon leading up to it and get little viability outside that. Yeah, kind of classic Zelda syndrome. Well, I guess the water scroll is pretty cool. This does open up exploration a bit and allow you to find new Bencho fields and Minkus. And the wind scroll can have some use in crowded areas with a bunch of enemies as you bump between them like a pinball machine. But besides these examples, I wasn't using these too much. Well, except for the final chapter. This makes full use of every ability you've learned so far, and guess what? It's super fun. It's the best part of the entire game. It just shows the potential these had if they were utilized a bit more. Speaking of abilities, let's talk about fusion abilities a bit. Like I said earlier, these can range a lot. Through sheer variety alone, I gotta give the game some credit. There are 27 abilities to assimilate in total. That's a pretty good amount. Not every enemy has an ability to assimilate, but a good amount of them do. I like that little symbol that pops up when you finish assimilating. It's a small touch, but a cool touch. As far as the abilities themselves, most of them are attack based, however, some of them are not. Some of them display a map of the dungeon you're in, some of them prevent bats from attacking you, some of them cure poison, some of them... cause poison? What? What's the point of this? Just to troll players? Getting poison doubly sucks in this game because not only do you lose HP, but you can't run either. Thankfully, not all abilities suck. Some of them are pretty damn cool. The last chapter in particular has a ton of cool abilities to assimilate. BP also drops a lot in this segment, encouraging you to use them as much as you want. This kind of brings me to the next thing I want to talk about. The first chapter and last chapter play out quite a bit differently than the rest and are like these linear set pieces. As I said earlier, there is no tired meter here and BP doesn't gradually drop. Chapters 2 through 5 on the other hand are more like these semi-open world segments where you tackle a new dungeon in each chapter, but can always go back to town whenever you want to stalk and rest up. I think this is a really cool idea as you get a variety of gameplay structure. It's just, I don't find the middle chapters to be engaging as the others due to multiple reasons. A small factor is you don't always get the clearest direction sometimes on where to go or what to do. I think this is why I gave up and never beat the game as a kid. I would just get lost and confused on what to do sometimes. It's not like the world's that big either, it's actually quite small. I'm just not a fan of how it's structured. 
Every path out of Grillin Village directly leads to a new area. There is no open world. I get that this is completely subjective, but in my opinion, I think this really hurts the game's immersion and sense of adventure feel. It just makes the journey feel a lot less grand and epic. Like, imagine if in Ocarina of Time, there was no overworld to travel around on. You couldn't walk around Hyrule Castle Town. The only town in the game was Kakariko Village, and the path leading out of it would bring you directly to the Lost Woods or Death Mountain or something. And in Kakariko Village, you couldn't even go inside any houses. That would feel pretty empty and lacking in content, right? Well, unfortunately, that's what Brave Friends of Musashi does. The world just doesn't feel nearly as fleshed out as it could have been. In my opinion, a much better setup would have been to have an overworld with Grillin Village smack dab in the middle. Think Lon Lon Ranch. You would then traverse by foot to places like Twin Peak Mountain, The Mines, Somnolent Forest, Steamwood Forest, and etc. I would also split up the various forests to different ends of the map. I never liked how all the forests are connected as it kind of confused me as a kid. Anyway, I think this would have given the game a much better sense of adventure. The overall didn't have to be that big. I know people complain about Ocarina of Time as being too big with nothing to do in it, but still, a little could have gone a long way. Mystical Ninja starring Goemon is another great example. In between dungeons, there are these more open world type areas and these really help a lot with the scope of the game's world. There's also various towns and fast travel. Man, I love that game, I gotta replay it soon. Would anyone be interested in a future retrospective? It's another Zelda-like game with another little spiky-haired Japanese dude and wacky humor. Honestly, I do prefer it over this game as well, but that's besides the point. I'm getting off topic now. If Brave Fenton Musashi wanted to make every chapter like Chapter 1 or Chapter 6, I don't think I would have minded that actually. This would have changed the game a lot, but hey, these segments were super fun. I think Chapter 6 is Brave Fenton Musashi at its best with the non-stop action and fun platforming. This is where we can utilize assimilation to its fullest potential as well, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. I'll talk about Chapter 6 in more detail during the spoiler segment, but for now, let's switch things up. There are multiple ways for Musashi to get stronger as the game progresses. As I said earlier, BP can be increased by finding Bencho Fields, and it also increases after defeating the Crest Guardians. For these it increases by 25 instead of just 5. Like I previously mentioned, HP is increased by finding those Minkus and eating their longevity berries. This also increases it by 25. Both HP and BP can eventually reach a max of 500, and I will say this is more than plenty. With that said, in addition to HP and BP increasing, Brave Fenton Musashi also has a level up system. It's not really a traditional one though. There are four separate categories to level up. Mind, Body, Fusion, and Lumina. Fusion and Lumina level up by... well, using Fusion and Lumina. Pretty self-explanatory. The more you use each individual sword, the more they'll level up and the more damage they'll do. Body can be leveled up by simply defeating enemies and this raises your overall attack power. On the other hand, Mind is tied to your defense and this can be increased by... running around? That's kinda random. Anyway, the average of these four stats determines your overall level, which has a max of 30. You definitely don't need to hit that though. When starting the last dungeon, I was only like level 20 I think and had no problems. I would say maxing out your HP is far more important than level alone. Going back to what I said earlier, outside of the first few hours or so, I never really felt like I was in that much danger. Don't get me wrong, the first few hours were pretty annoying as my HP and BP were low and I struggled with finding money to buy restoration items, but eventually this becomes a non-issue. I feel like money is pretty hard to come across at first unless you know what you're doing. Not only are items expensive, but so is staying at the inn. There's different types of rooms you can stay in that range in price. The cheaper the room, the less HP and BP you'll recover. To keep up with all this, I kinda feel like I had to grind for money at the start. There was this one spot in Somnolent Forest I grinded for a while waiting for this enemy to respawn and yeah, it was pretty easy, but also pretty boring. A much more efficient method is playing cards with Macho at the bar. It's basically just a guessing game based on odds and luck, but it's still really easy to rack up tons of money. After like 10 to 15 minutes of this, I was set for the entire game. Whatever you do though, if you do manage to win 9 in a row, don't go for the 10th. If you do and happen to win, he'll never play you again. Anyway, doing this pretty much makes money obsolete as you can buy whatever you want at this point. Throughout the main game, cheeses are definitely the best item to stock up on. It heals both HP and BP and gets stronger with time. Hold on to them long enough and it's pretty much a full refill on HP and BP. Oh yeah, that's another thing. The passing of time affects certain items which is admittedly a cool concept. However, while it is cool, it can also be a little annoying. It affects cheese in a positive way, but bread? 
Nah, son, that shit's getting moldy as fuck. After a few days, bread becomes worthless, so I just stop buying these. The only exceptions are biscuits, which for some reason do not spoil. Yeah, not sure how that works. Milk is handled in a pretty interesting way. First it turned sour, which is obviously not good, but then it turned into yogurt, which is even better than before. I know I was a bit critical earlier about how this game utilizes its time mechanic, but stuff like this is really cool. Dungeons in Brave Finch and Musashi are a pretty good time. If Zelda dungeons are about puzzles in action, Musashi dungeons are about platforming in action. There really aren't any traditional puzzles in this game. Thinking instead comes from figuring out which nearby abilities you need to assimilate to progress forward. The same thing for using your scrolls, however, these are more obvious. I never really found any of the dungeons that hard, but if any of them do happen to give you some trouble, the game gives you what it calls a memory box. This allows you to store your memories, so if you happen to die, you'll be revived here instead of all the way back at town. I never needed it, but it's nice to have. The dungeons themselves are cool, I just wish there were a bit more of them. Brave Finch and Musashi in general is a pretty short game. Probably will only take you around 15 to maybe 20 hours to do everything the game has to offer. For an action RPG, this isn't a bad length actually, it's just that when some of that length comes from a little padding like napping and waiting around for shops to open, it feels a little shorter than it actually is. As I said near the beginning of the video, bosses in Brave Finch and Musashi are a real highlight. These are some of the most fun parts of the entire game, specifically the Crest Guardians. Each of them require the use of one of the scrolls you just found. You need to use the Earth Scroll against the Scorpion, the Water Scroll against the Relic Keeper, the Fire Scroll against the Frost Dragon, the Wind Scroll against the Queen Ant, and the Sky Scroll against the Tower of Death. I found the battles against the Scorpion and Relic Keeper just okay and more visually interesting than anything, but the Frost Dragon and Queen Ant? These were incredibly awesome and fun. Everything about the Frost Dragon boss fight is just epic. It's easily one of the most memorable parts of the entire game. Let's just say there's a reason why they stuck him on the cover. The Queen Ant was also a lot of fun that I found to be a tough but fair challenge. Ironically, the only times I actually died were against the very first two bosses. I already explained why the Steam Knight was a little hard, but the Sculpion? Honestly, I just underestimated him and didn't bring enough healing items. I think I forgot to sleep beforehand as well, so I was just walking around like an idiot. Definitely my fault. I don't think he was that hard, it was just ill preparation. When you're sufficiently prepared, no problem. Really, my only gripe with these bosses is that sometimes striking their weaknesses can be a little janky. Multiple times I'd be rushing to get over there and then whiff a couple times or something and have to start the cycle all over again. This was pretty annoying. No, oh well, everything else about these boss fights, good stuff. With that said, that praise really only extends to the big bosses, not the human bosses. Kojiro's boss fight is one of the most anticlimactic and lamest fights ever. I never got this far as a kid, but I remember looking at the instruction manual and being like, oh, this dude looks cool, I bet his fight is epic. No, the character Musashi is based off a real-life person of the same name who's the most famous and respected Japanese swordsman of all time. He won over 60 duels and went on record saying that Kojiro was the best opponent he ever faced. Considering Kojiro from this game is obviously based off him, I was expecting this insanely epic duel. As you can see, that's uh, not really what I got here. Yeah, this could have been done way better. Thankfully, the other human bosses are definitely an improvement, but I'll talk about them during the spoiler segment. Let's talk mini games real quick. The ones like the rafting in Twin Peak Mountain or the minecart rides, these were really fun. I like them. They're definitely not easy, the mines in particular are pretty hard, however, they're also very forgiving in how they're set up. You get infinite retries, and there's even checkpoints throughout them. So yeah, while it is challenging, it's a fair challenge. It's not stressful as you don't have to worry about losing heaps of progress. You can just focus on completing the task ahead and having fun. <sighs> Steamwood though. Fucking Steamwood. Fuck this place. Easily the worst part of the entire game. I remember a while back we put this game on our video about cozy and relaxing RPGs and we got some comments saying stuff like, Yeah, it is pretty cozy for the most part, but Steamwood? That part was stressful as hell. Well, as a kid, I got to the first Steamwood part, but never the second. The first part's not bad at all, so I was a bit confused by these comments. All you really do is go to these valves and do this little timing minigame to close them. It's not the most exciting, but it's simple enough and kind of fun. For now, that is. For whatever reason, the game thought this was a fun enough concept to do a second time and... Uh, oh boy. 
If the first time was easy mode, the second time is ridiculously expert hard master mode. They made this so hard and I have no idea why. While the time limit in the first part was very forgiving, it is not here. The overall time limit isn't bad, it's just the individual time limit to get to the next valve. It's only 35 seconds sometimes and the time still ticks when trying to close them, creating this high pressure environment. It's not a straight shot this time either. Some pathways will be blocked, forcing you to either go the long way around or take a risky jump where you can maybe fall below. And you need to find a few handles in the first place before you can even close some of them. What makes this even more annoying is there are these moving platforms you have to worry about that move really slow. If you happen to catch it on a bad cycle, well, sorry, you're wasting the next 10 to 15 seconds just waiting around. Your first attempt will definitely just be trying to plan an optimal route so you can get to everything in time. Seriously, I doubt a single person completed this in their first try. If you did, let us know in the comments. You're either a liar or a god among mortals and I bow in your presence. After a few attempts, I finally made it to Valve 8 and didn't have much time to spare so I had to perform near flawlessly. Did I rise to the occasion? Did I choke? Let's find out. to start again. Fuck. It moves so fast here and the box is so small. Ah, oh, fuck man, it's so annoying. I had to restart multiple times and spent like 30 minutes to maybe even an hour just trying to beat this damn thing. Why did they put this in here a second time? It wasn't even that fun the first time and it has like zero effect on the story. You could remove this part entirely and the game would be unaffected. Well, it would be affected actually, just in a good way, but yeah, you get my point. Honestly, just the thought of having to replay this part over again kind of kills much desire to replay this game. It's that bad. On the bright side, finally beating it will be one of the biggest sighs of relief you'll ever have. Anyway, I've been ranting about Steam Wind for over two minutes now, so yeah, let's move on. When it comes to the visuals, Musashi may not have aged as well as some of its contemporaries due to going full 3D. However, I still think the game has a lot of charm in more of a rough type way. Character models are... fine? Not the worst I've seen, but certainly not the best either. Environments in their standard form look a little basic, but occasionally the game will switch up to these more cinematic shots and these look really cool. The entrance to the Frozen Palace immediately comes to mind. The same goes for after you get the Sky Scrolls, you approach the Thirst Quencher Empire. There's some really cool cinematic shots here. However, when it does go cinematic, sometimes it can also be a bad thing. I mean, look at this shot that happens not even a minute after the others. Oof. I can count all the different colors of brown by their individual tiles. Yeah, the texture game can be a little weak at times. What's not weak though are the dialogue boxes. Yeah, after our last video, you knew I had to talk about this. They fit the game well and the portraits look nice. Would have liked some different expressions, but eh, it's all good. Every character in the game has a portrait, so that's something. The box itself also occasionally changes shape and at first I thought this was based on the emotion of the person talking and I think it kind of is, but it also didn't seem super consistent with this. Still though, it's a cool touch and this idea in general has a lot of potential. I'd love to see other games utilize this. Sometimes a word will be read as well and I think this is supposed to signify something important, but again, it's also kind of just random at times. While we're talking UI, let's talk the menu screen. Eh, not a fan of this really. I like the colors, I just don't like how it's structured. It just feels a little cluttered and like there's too much going on. The music in Brave Friends of Musashi is truly excellent. I'd say it's even one of the standout aspects about the game. Cozy songs are cozy, and adventurous themes spark a sense of adventure. There's also these tracks that have like this mystical, enchanted vibe, and these are really cool too. I know Tsuyoshi's had a long, successful career and still gets a lot of work to this day, but I'd like to see him get another chance at a head roll. Dude's got the stuff. I think my favorites are the Grill and Village themes, the All You Can Eat Palace theme, Wondrous Flower, the Musashi Legend, Twin Peak Mountains, and My Only Friend. Topo's theme is an absolute banger too. I mean hell, the All You Can Eat Palace theme even changes throughout the game with more instruments added as you find new musicians. This is really cool. Know what's also pretty cool? The voice acting. In terms of the PS1, this has probably got to be some of the best on the console. It's not a very high bar, but still. In fact, out of the PS1 games I played at least, I think it does have the best voice acting. If you've played a PS1 game with better voice acting, let me know in the comments, I'm genuinely curious. With that said, I don't want to hype it up too much. Keep in mind, I said for PS1 standards. Many games the next generation to blow this game's voice acting out of the water, but you gotta give credit where it's due. There's a lot of great talent in the cast. 
You got Mona Marshall as Musashi, probably best known for her roles as Izzy and Digimon and Sheila Broflosky from South Park. Your brother was being punished for using the computer and you decide to just leave with him? And she still voices her to this day? Oh shit. Never knew that Brave Hinted Musashi and Sheila Broflosky were the same person. You really do learn something new every day. Anyway, this was before any of those roles though and at the very beginning of her career so she was kind of a nobody at this point. Her performance as Musashi here is kind of a little bit too much like this. But I mean, yeah, it's still pretty charming. It's definitely got that Saturday morning cartoon vibe down. No surprise she would then go to beyond Saturday morning cartoons, or anime, whatever. Another prolific voice actor we have here is the legendary Steve Bloom as John. We always get Toonami vibe comments on our intro and hey, what do you know, it's the voice of Toonami himself. And of course, the man Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, this dude always voices cool as shit characters. With that said, his performance here feels a little flat. <laughs> well, to put it simply, I searched the world looking for treasure. I experienced life. You know, I guess that's it. <laughs> I mean, it was early on in his career after all. In general, the voices themselves are pretty good, they just mainly lack direction. A good amount of lines are delivered very weirdly and like they didn't have proper context. A lot of characters talk in their own dialect too. I already mentioned how Rutrik talks in a southern accent. However, the princess and Bubbles also talk in this valley girl type accent. Like the cat's got your tongue? Well, whatever. Give me Lumina! There's a lot of likes, for sure. Then you got people like Stuart Ribson with this over-the-top old English accent. He honestly kind of bothered me at first, but then when he started making up words like robotith and shit, I was like, alright, this guy's hamming it up to the fullest degree. I'm kind of here for it now. Does any of this really make cohesive sense in the world? No, but it gives the game tons of charm and personality. The characters themselves, uh, I'm more mixed about. On one hand, I really love their designs. Nomura did an awesome job here. By the way, real quick, earlier I said that Tetsuya Nomura was a character designer, but I guess that's technically not true. He was a character illustrator and the designer was Koji Matsuoka. I'm not exactly sure what that means. I think that means he either created the ideas for the characters or took Nomura's art and translated them to in-game models. I don't know. Anyway. They say a rule for good character design is that every character should be recognizable by the silhouette alone and, well, Brave Fence and Musashi excels in that. Every major character has a very distinct shape and style. If they try to do a who's that Pokemon game with Musashi characters, even a six year old would look at you like, bro, fucking serious? It really is top tier character design. I think my favorites are Musashi, Kojiro, Capricola, and John. I like how the game is supposed to be all medieval and John has this modern urban outfit on. 12 year old me really liked ginger ale, bubbles, and topo because... <clears throat> reasons? By the way, I'm just now realizing most characters don't have a nose. Interesting. Anyway, love the designs, it's just you don't see enough of them. The screen time for many characters is just too low in my opinion. Characters like Rutrik, Bubbles, Ginger Ale, Kojiro, Ben, Ed, Topo, and Capric Cola you only see like two or three times in the entire game. If that sounds like I named every villain in the game, it's because... Yeah, I just did. There's way too many villains here, none of them are fleshed out enough. They get like 5 to maybe 10 minutes of screen time, no joke. It's like they spread themselves too thin and wanted to create all these wacky characters but didn't do enough to justify their existence. Ginger Ale and Bubbles suffer the most from this, I think. You never even fight them. I mean, to be fair, I guess Bubbles is kind of included in a boss fight, but Ginger Ale literally does nothing the entire game. Hell, after a certain point, they both just straight up disappear and never show up again. They make it seem like they're going to as well, so it just seems like a really odd design choice to have them disappear like that. Like almost every other character, you find out what happens to them, but them too? Deuces. It almost makes me wonder if there was supposed to be a sequel planned where they come back. Man, yeah, I know this game later got a sequel to the PS2, but I'm talking about one in the same world. I guess we'll never know. Honestly, I feel like they should have just cut out Ben and Ed entirely and just have the leader for Speed Topo, Bubbles, and Ginger Ale. Ben and Ed kinda suck, and as someone who has an actual stutter, Ned, I know your ass is faking it. Uh, 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 uh. And Ben, his entire personality is that he's a dumbass and has a half-eaten potato chip for a brain. Anyway, this would have allowed them to flesh them out a bit more instead of just trying to cram in a little screen time for everyone. And plus, it would have given it some Mio, Saki, and Nana vibes from Grandia, and I would have been cool with that. Alright, before I talk about the last chapter and then my closing thoughts, there's a couple other small things I want to mention real quick. I know a lot of you have been waiting for me to bring this up. The toys. Yes, in Brave Prince and Musashi, you can buy and collect toys to play in your room. This serves zero in-game function and is purely for your enjoyment. 
You can unlock more toys at the toy store by progressing through the game and defeating new enemies. Once you buy them, you can open them up in your room and play with them. They have two actions they can perform and usually a voice sample that comes with it. I kinda had fun fucking around with this and spamming these, getting them to make weird noises. Well, uh, well, uh, well, uh, well, uh. Be careful if you open them though, as you can't put them back in their box, hurting their resale value and... <laughs> nah, while this is true, I mean, who gives a fuck? None of this matters. You've ruined the collector's value! Never remove from books! NRFB! NRFB! At the beginning of this video, I said I 100% completed this game, but I guess that's actually a lie. There's a special series of toys that requires, well, special requirements to unlock. Some of these are self-explanatory and pretty easy to figure out, but there's a few of them that even the official strategy guide got wrong. It says that John and Leno, Dark Lumina 2, and Dark Lumina 3 appear at random after beating the game, but that's not true. To unlock John and Leno, you need to open up every treasure chest in the game. This one I did do. Dark Lumina 2? Things get a little more unclear. I've read conflicting information about either needing Lumina to be a level 30, or your overall level to be 28, which gives you the Brave Fencer title. This one I did not do because, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't feel like grinding for over an hour. Call me lazy, call me a liar, whatever. This and Dark Lumina 3 are the only ones I didn't get. Oh yeah, Dark Lumina 3 you unlock by buying every other toy. Apparently, the only thing you get after collecting every toy is after beating the game, the word Finn appears in red instead of white. Is this worth it? Eh, not really. Just bragging rights, I guess. So yeah, the toys may not serve an actual purpose in the game, but, you know, it's the small things that matter. For such a trivial aspect, they get brought up a lot in discussions online. It's a great example of how the little things can stick with you even if they don't actually matter that much. Speaking of that, Chapter 3 stuck with me for this reason. In Chapter 3, there's this part where you have to save this kid named Tim. You have to get this medicine from Twin Peak Mountain under its time limit, and if you don't, he turns into a Vambi, which is like this zombie-like creature. You'd think if you failed, you'd have to reload and try again, but no. The game just moves on. If you do fail to save him, you can't access the grocery store for the rest of the chapter, and the innkeeper Hotello gets replaced by Motello for the rest of the game. Tim does eventually recover, though. Even still, I just thought this was pretty interesting how they went about it. Very few JRPGs back then had game-impacting events like this, even as minor as it is. On a semi-related note, though, I hate the music that plays during this chapter. Instead of the usual cozy vibe, we get this eerie, foreboding track instead, and yeah, just not a fan. I like the town being a place of comfort, and this track is not comforting. Especially when the Bambies come out at night, but I kinda like that actually, it's a cool touch. Alright, so I've been alluding to the final chapter this entire video, so let's finally talk about it. In this chapter, we take down the Thirst Quencher Empire at their base, the Soda Fountain. By the way, did you know in the original Japanese version, instead of having normal drink names, they were named after alcohol instead? Yeah, classic Soda Popinski and Vodka Drunkinski case from Punch-Out. Anyway, if you don't want to be spoiled on the last chapter and just want to skip to my closing thoughts, skip to the timestamps on screen or just click the next chapter. I'll give you guys a little time. Be good? Alright, let's go. So, this last chapter is basically a giant gauntlet that has three dungeon-like areas and six bosses. Yeah, you heard me right. Six. That's almost as much as there's been in the entire game up until this point. Fortunately, you are able to save after bosses though, so don't worry. Even still though, you're going to want to make sure you're fully prepared. I recommend buying an S-Revive and stocking up on as many x drinks as possible. Cheeses aren't as effective here, you don't really need BP in the last chapter. The one time you do need it, BP restoration drops drop like crazy anyway. Oh yeah, that reminds me. When you have the choice to decide either between the legendary gloves or the legendary quilt, go with the gloves. The quilt is definitely better during the main game as when you nap, it reduces your tired meter to zero and in addition to HP being restored, BP is also restored as well. The problem is though, you can't nap in the last chapter, making this entirely useless. On the other hand, the gloves increase your chance of critical hits and this did help on some boss fights. Alright, the first area tests our skill with our newly acquired Sky Scroll. This first part is pretty hard actually, his turning is stiff. After you get a hang of the controls, it's not that bad, but I took a lot of damage at first. The second platforming segment is much easier and really fun. The first boss we have up is Ben. It's mainly a test of patience. If you're too aggressive, you're gonna get wrecked. I would use the Sky Scroll to help dodge his bombs, and after dodging his other attacks, I would jump in and hit him with the Rumparoni SP technique. Rinse and repeat until dead. After you beat him, I think he dies standing up. I didn't think he died at first, but after defeating the other bosses, yeah, I do think that's what they intended here. Weird pose to kick the bucket, but eh, it's all good. The second area is a test of all your five scrolls. It's kind of like a puzzle as well, as if you enter the wrong door, you have to start from the beginning. 
With that said, it's pretty easy to figure out as the calendar tells you what doors to enter. Fuck that one jump of the wind scroll at the very end though. I missed this like five times and had to restart all the way over. Anyway, the second boss we have up is Ed. I actually found him a little hard. His pattern is easy enough to learn, but dodging it is easier said than done. His Kamehameha way follows you pretty closely, so you have to like juke it out. After we commit first degree murder on this dude, the most fun part of the entire game starts up. It kind of feels like a reward for making it this far, as the game just gives you a giant playground to go crazy with assimilation. It's just non-stop, high-speed action. Honestly, I should have experimented around more, but man, the homing missiles were just so much fun and so powerful. I had a literal blast just jumping around and dodging enemies' attacks while sending these babies out. The only thing I don't like about this section is that it just makes me wish we got more of them throughout the game. Assimilation is always a thing, but it's never really utilized to this degree. To be fair, I guess this moment wouldn't hit as hard in that case, and if assimilation was always that powerful, it would make your swords kind of useless, but still, fun is fun. No, oh well, just gotta enjoy the good times while they last. At the end of this section, we face off against Topo, but not in a traditional battle. Instead of fighting her in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we have to fight her feet-to-feet -feet in a dance battle. Yeah, you heard that right. Stuff like this is a perfect example of why this game was just so damn charming and memorable. I love it. This plays out like a rhythm game, and I said it before, but I'll say it again. This song is an absolute banger. It's so damn catchy, I could bop to this shit all night. I had a little bit of trouble figuring out when I was supposed to go at first, but once you know what to do, it's super easy. You don't need to remember anything, just wait for her to go again and copy her exactly. After kicking her ass in three rounds, she admits defeat in the most dramatic fashion. Ah, you're too good! She then drops a dance pun on us and tells us how we've actually been helping them the entire time by collecting the five scrolls. Huh, I'll expand on this in a bit. Is Topo actually dead? Oh, what's going on? We then take the elevator up and, well... Oh! Oh no! My legs! That was my final rave! Farewell, dearest Capricola! Yeah, I guess she's dead, alright. Uh, death by dance. Always a sad way to go out. Gotta love that voice acting, though. Now we have the last Crest Guardian the Tower of Death. This boss fight is unlike any other in the game. You're floating the entire time and have to dodge all these walls and lasers while occasionally striking the open eye. It's easier said than done though, as movement is not super smooth. At first I was like, okay, this isn't that bad, but the last fourth of his health bar took me like five minutes alone. This last part is hard as the window to strike is pretty small and there's a lot of verticality so you can't see everything on screen at once. I used up a lot of X-strings here. After enough struggle, I finally beat it. Our BP is now maxed at 500 and, okay, I feel like they didn't really think this through. BP is no longer used for the rest of the game. Why are we getting an upgrade now? I get the BP upgrades have always been tied to Guardians, but yeah, I guess it was kind of just an oversight putting this part in here. We now have a standoff between Musashi, Capricola, Fear Flatsky, and the Princess, and this is where shit gets interesting. Out of nowhere, Capricola starts directing his hostility towards Fear Flatsky in, in a stunning turn of events. It turns out that Capricola is actually... Dun dun dun? John. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I saw this twist coming from a mile away. As a Steve Bloom fanboy, I'd recognize that voice anywhere. I guess that John is actually the Thirst Quencher Prince as well, and Fear Flasky murdered his parents. He's about to finally get his revenge and shoot him, before Rutrik shows up behind him and shoots him first instead. I guess that Rutrik is actually the son of Flasky as well? Huh, okay. Flasky then wants us to trade Lumina for the princess, and against John's wishes, we do just that. He throws her like a rag doll, and Jesus Christ, dude, that was so unnecessary. Even in the game's most serious moments, you always get slapstick humor like this. Unfortunately, he then uses the power of Lumina to release the Wizard of Darkness. Yeah, it turns out it wasn't sealed by Lumina, but sealed within Lumina. John's then like, yeah, why do you think the Crest Guardians were guarding the scrolls in the first place? On one hand, I really like the deconstruction of this trope. In so many games, we're defeating bosses and collecting MacGuffins, and it's like, yeah, maybe they were guarding that shit for a reason. With that said though, uh, John's motive makes absolutely zero sense. Throughout the whole game, he's dropping hints on finding scrolls, finding armor, and just helping us out on our journey. But why? He only had a vendetta against Flasky and could have shot him whenever, so why did he need Musashi at all? He has the audacity to be like, ah, oh, why'd you give him Lumina? The Guardians were guarding the scrolls for a reason. And it's like, dude, you literally wanted me to do all of this and help me do it. What is your deal? If it was a bad thing for Flasky to get a hold of Lumina, then why did you lead me here? 
Yeah, probably the biggest plot hole in the entire game. Same with Rutrik, Ginger Ale, and Bubbles getting away. Yeah, Rutrik disappears after this too. What a bastard. He may have gotten away a foot, but Flasky? Well, not so much luck. He's under a foot now. Unfortunately, same with our homie John. Man, for such a lighthearted game, a lot of people die. We now have a little platforming segment where Dark Lumina chases us, and this is pretty easy. We then run into Kojiro's bitch ass again as he's gotten a hold of the princess. This is like the third time she's gotten kidnapped and the game pokes fun at it too. Looks like we're about to get a rematch with Kojiro and hell yeah, hopefully this time is epic. No time to chit chat! Musashi, get ready to perish! Princess, watch out! What? God, Kojiro, you fucking showed an absolute waste of space. You never do anything. He gets absorbed by Dark Lumina and ends up being the evolution stone needed for it to evolve to its next form. Hey, I recognize that guy. It's the guy from the instruction manual. I always wondered when he was going to show up. Anyway, we now have another platforming segment where Dark Lumina chases us again. It's pretty easy, but it's like close to a minute of the same jump. I was like, damn, bro, are we done yet? We finally make it to the top and, ah, the princess is here. Not sure how she survived getting blasted off the screen, but hey, we'll take it. It's time for the showdown against Dark Lumina. You have to strike that glowy thing on his head enough times till it turns red, then you can damage him with Lumina. At first I thought you had to wait for openings and chip away little by little, and was like, ugh, man, this is gonna take a while. Multiple times I missed my opportunity to damage him as I either couldn't make it there in time, or I just kept missing due to the janky hitbox. He also kept throwing me off too, and thank god this is not an instant death as he threw me off like 10 times. Luckily, I had plenty of healing items left, so I was really in no risk of dying. I eventually figured out that you actually don't need to wait for openings in between attacks and can stun lock him with a jumping attack. And after I got this down, he stood no chance. Upon defeat, he evolves to his third form and now commences the true final boss. Dark Lumina will change forms throughout the battle and have different attacks, requiring you to make use of all your different elemental scrolls to fend them off. It's a pretty fun fight. For a final boss, he's pretty easy though. Well, once you figure out how to damage him, that is. I had no idea you needed to use assimilation on him, so I just spent like the first few minutes running around like an idiot doing zero damage. Even after figuring it out, the window to strike him is small. That's probably the hardest part here. In a matter of time, Dark Lumina is finally defeated, and the day is saved. Just Brave French and Musashi doing Brave French and Musashi things. The game then cuts over to the All You Can Eat Kingdom. Really nice shot here. We got Musashi, the princess, Ribson, and hey, look who it is, the king and queen. Nice of you guys to finally show up. A little late, but you know, better late than never, right? Apparently they were on vacation the whole time. They bring up the castle being destroyed, but don't really question it. That is until the princess thanks Musashi for saving her life, and they're like, oh wait, did something happen? No, the castle got destroyed for no reason, what do you think? Anyway, I'll let this last bit play out so you can see the vibe the game ends on. Enjoy. Princess, I'm gonna go return this. Back in a flash. Alright, Musashi. Be careful. <laughs> That's Lumina! The Sword of Luminescence! Oh, gracious me! And the name Musashi. You cannot be... I'm the legendary brave fencer Musashi. How's it going, old man? Motherfucking brave Finch and Musashi, dude. God, what a good game. I can't think of a more perfect line to end the game on. There's a lot of really cool art during the credits before the game ends with Musashi returning Lumina. I like the way that it transitions into the Squaresoft logo too. Really cool stuff. For those interested in watching this, we'll show a sped up version, and if you'd rather just skip to my closing thoughts, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter.
First of all, I'm just gonna say, Brave Prince of Musashi is a really good game. It's extremely memorable with an incredibly charming world, aesthetic, and characters. The music is excellent, the gameplay is fun, the voice acting is great for the time, and the day and night cycle is super ambitious. Square made a lot of really creative choices here and went in a wildly different direction compared to most of their previous titles, and I respect that. With all that said, there are just some aspects in the game that I myself personally don't really jive with. I want to make things clear though, these aren't faults with the game itself, just my personal gripes. I do think the game has some faults, like platforming can be a little janky at times due to the death perception, and attacking enemies can be a little annoying at times due to the hitbox. However, these never deterred my enjoyment from the game. I mean, yeah, it's annoying in the moment, but you move on in like a second. Okay, well I guess how they handled some characters and plot elements I wasn't a fan of either. Musashi doesn't even meet Capricorn until the last chapter. I think they needed some more interactions for his twist to have more of a payoff. Anyway, I can look past all this stuff. I'm not playing the game for the story. My biggest problems with the game is the world just doesn't feel that big or open enough, and I'm just not a fan of the tired meter and BP gradually dropping. I feel like I was always just waiting for the game to open up more, and it never really did. It's kind of cool that all the areas connect back to the same town, but it also just makes the world feel kind of small in scope. Games like Ocarina of Time and Mystical Ninja just feel more epic and grander in scope to me as you're traveling all across the land. Unfortunately, I never really got that same feel from Musashi. In its defense though, I'm sure a game like Ocarina of Time had a way bigger budget, a bigger team, and more overall time to work on it. Given the circumstances, I think Square did an awesome job. But yeah, the tired meter and BP gradually dropping, I don't think this adds anything, I ought to have taken it out. Again, this really only affects the first few hours, and you could argue that it gives it an element of resource management, but I don't know. I'm not playing a game like Brave Fence and Musashi for resource management. I just want a fun, light-hearted world to explore around and assimilate shit. Plus the whole resource management thing becomes a non-factor later in the game anyway. Probably no coincidence that I started enjoying the game more at this point as well. I'm not gonna lie, it really grew on me. The first few hours or so, I was pretty lukewarm with my thoughts about the game, but by the end, I was really enjoying it. It never really lived up to my full potential, however, I shouldn't judge it on what it is in, but rather what it is. I understand that earlier I was projecting what I wanted the game to be instead of just appreciating it for what it already is. And what it is is one of the most charming and memorable action RPG platformers from the era. Personally, I don't know if I would call Brave Fence and Musashi an amazing game, but it is a damn good game. Hell, it's a damn great game. It absolutely deserves more love these days and would greatly benefit from either a remake or a remaster. There are some aspects that haven't aged that well, but a remake it fixes right up. This very well could happen. Hell, if we can get a worldwide Live Alive remake in 2022, anything is possible. Not if, but when that time comes, I'll be ready, waiting with Lumina. Until then, just remember... The name's Musashi, you geezer! And don't you dare forget it. Alright, and that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please either consider hitting that like button, or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. I figured a more humorous game deserved a more humorous voiceover, and I'm not really sure if every joke landed, but nay. That stays pretty consistent with how I feel about the game. Not every ambitious idea landed for me, but I respect the effort nonetheless. Similar to our Wild Arms retrospective, when I first got to writing the script, I was like, eh, this'll maybe be like 30 some minutes or so, and... Well, we all know how that story went. I think that's a good sign that it really did grow on me. Square would take another stab at a lighthearted 3D action RPG a couple years later, and while I don't really remember too much about this and the setting and structure are obviously different, it does seem like it's more polished in some aspects. I mean, it came out later, so it makes sense. I'd be curious to revisit that one sometime. Playing Musashi in general just made me feel nostalgic towards these type of games from this particular era. I already talked about Zelda and Mystical Ninja, but there's also Mega Man Legends as well. Still gotta play the first one. I only play the second. Anyway, I'm super off topic now. How do you guys feel about Brave Fence and Musashi, and what's your favorite part of the game? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, just want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters, and an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Derek Drost, Jesse Spencer, Jump Rock, and Sayano. All of your support and generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone, and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.